Father in heaven, we count it a privilege this evening to be able to come and study your word once more. May you please guide us now, O Lord. Lead us, teach us, and guide us through the truth. Illumine our hearts and minds with your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Well, as we continue our series on the early kings, we are looking at the life of David and Saul. And today we are looking at the Lord's anointed. At this point in time, David is already a man on the run. He is a fugitive. He's being hunted by Saul because of Saul's jealousy of him. And he lied to the priest Ahimelech, which eventually, as a result, cost the lives of all the priests there, all except one. And then when he ran off into the, the heathen lands, he feigned madness before King Achish just because he was afraid for his life. And so eventually David would come into the wilderness and he would settle down. And this is what we read in 1 Samuel chapter 22 and verse 1. The Bible says, David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Adullam. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. And so all those that were seeking um, refuge, that were running from the wrath of Saul, they were afraid for their lives, they would come and seek refuge where David was in the cave of Adullam. How they heard about him or how they found him, we have no idea. But his family, of course, would come there because they were also in danger because of David himself. And even the, the was, there was one priest that escaped the wrath of Saul. His name was Abiathar, and he would also come seeking refuge with David. And, you know, even though David had stumbled for a moment, even though he had lied to the priests there, even though he had acted incorrectly before King Achish, um, his faith still had not let go of God. God was still with him. He had not abandoned him. And that is good news, friends. That's good news for us because we realize that even as humans, we make mistakes. But God does not just because in a moment that we, we have this um, burst of passion that causes us to do something that we would not normally do. God does not just leave us and abandon us altogether. And so we continue reading in 1 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 6. Then they told David, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Calah, and they rob the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go and smite these Philistines? And the Lord said unto David, Go and smite the Philistines and save Calah. And David's men said unto him, Behold, we be afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we come to Calah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Calah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So David and his men went to Calah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Calah. And it came to pass when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Calah. Then he came down with an ephod in his hand. And so we see here that even God still communicated with David. God still worked through him. And he went and fought the Philistines by a clear direction from God. They were in the, the land of the enemies and the, the people that were following David, they were afraid. They're saying, look, if, if we're in Judah, of course, then we'll be safe. But now we're taking refuge amongst all the enemies. If we fight against the Philistines, won't they just come out simply and attack us? And so David double-checked with God. He made sure that he sought God for a clear directive, for a clear answer, and he asked Abiathar, who was a priest, and he had brought an ephod with him, which was a way that God communicated to the people through the priests, and God gave an affirmative. He God, God gave a very clear direction, and though even though that God did not approve of David's prior actions, God did not abandon David in his time of need. Obviously, David 
must have repented of his minor sins there. And not to say that anything of a sin is minor, but of his lying, of his misdirection in terms of his actions. Even though he had done that, he had repented, he had made it right with God. God was still willing to communicate with him and work through him as well. And friends, this is what we read in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 16. It says, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. You know, friends, even though we might fall, even though we might stumble, if we continue to seek God and ask for forgiveness and we seek Him with repentance, God will strengthen us. He will help us. And so we see that even in the life of David. Look, David was not perfect. He wasn't. And he had his own shortcomings. But yet, he was always quick to admit his faults. He was always quick to say sorry, to to repent, to change, to ask God to help him. And so God still worked through him. And this is good news for us, for if we would do the same, friends, even though you might have stumbled, we can even right now close our eyes, seek God in prayer and ask him to forgive us, and he will restore to us back a right relationship and right standing with him. He desires to work through all of us. He desires to bless us. He desires to guide us and to lead us, friends. But if only we would come back to him. But anyways, let's keep reading, shall we? We read in 1 Samuel 23, verses 14 and 15. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. And so, though God was with David, it did not stop Saul from continuing to seek his life, to try to kill him. God did not allow David to be delivered into his hands. He would continue to protect him and thwart the purposes and the plans of Saul. But Saul would even enlist other people's help to try to help him to find David so that he could kill him. Let's keep reading. In verse 19 of 1 Samuel 23, Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hekela, which is in the south of Jeshimon? And so even though these Ziphites would assist Saul to show Saul where David was, God would still protect him. You know, friends, that's the most important thing that we find in Scripture, that if we are in right relationship with God, we need not be afraid what will happen. In this case, yes, God protected David from the wrath of Saul. And there are other times that we see in terms of not David's life, but in other prophets, in other people's lives, God does not spare them from persecution. He does not spare them from a beating or a whipping. He does not spare them from a shipwreck or imprisonment. You look at the life of Joseph when he was a good boy in his father's house, yet he would be sold as a slave. He was a righteous person in Potiphar's house, yet he would end up in prison. And so God has his purposes. God has his plans. And we need not to have to expect that every time we're faithful, God will protect us. God will open up a way and make every path clear and the way smooth. Friends, whatever comes our way, if we are right with God, we can trust him that he has a purpose for everything. But let's continue, shall we? 1 Samuel 23, 25 to 28. So Saul, after he gets the news from the Ziphites, also and his men, they would go to seek him. And they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. But there came a messenger unto Saul, saying, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selahamalekoth. 
So the Philistines would come out and attack and Saul for a moment would have to leave off looking for David. God would protect David once more. And so we see the constant watch care that God has for David, a constant reminder even to David, hey, I'm with you. You do not need to resort to worldly measures, dishonest practices, whatever it is, just to save your own life. God cares for our lives more than we even care for our own sometimes. And so there would eventually come an opportunity for David really to take revenge against Saul. Saul, in his haste to continue chasing after David, would be careless in a way and then we see, so we see this encounter, you see, in 1 Samuel 24, verses 1 to 4. And it came to pass, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel, and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheepcoats, by the way, where was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. You know, friends, what would you have done if you were in the situation of King David. Oh, really, David at this time, time, not king yet. The opportunity came for David to take revenge, to be able to just with one smite, one hit, to strike down Saul and take his life. What would you have done? Many of us, if not all of us, we would have been sitting there and say, hey, providence, we've been running, we've been hiding, and now we're in this cave and all of a sudden, Saul is sitting here. He's sitting there resting. He is unguarded. He is unaware. He has no idea. And many of us would think, oh, God, you're, on, you're the one that brought us, brought this man into our way, right? I'm sure all of us would have thought this way, just like those soldiers. Saul is right there, right within striking distance the one that has been hunting him for no good reason, surely it would have been a big temptation, right? Surely God is guiding up to this point. But instead, David just simply cuts off the edge of Saul's garment. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel 24, 5 to 7. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he, has cut, he had cut off Saul's skirt. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. So David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went his way. Just the simple act of cutting off the edge, the skirt of Saul's garment, it already hurt the heart of David. He was smote in his heart, the Bible says. And even though David knew already he would be the next king, it was Samuel that had anointed him to be the next king, he would not raise up his hand against the current king, which God had also anointed as well. He said, I will not raise my hand against the Lord's anointed. And surely Saul was the anointed of the Lord. And yes, he had been rejected from being king. But David would not be the one that would take justice and revenge into his own hands and kill the king of Israel. He would patiently wait and allow God to work out the situation in his time even though it seemed like it was that time that God had brought this man into their very midst for David to take revenge, to give him the opportunity to kill him. But friends, can you imagine what it would look like to the whole nation of Israel, right? David, the newly anointed king, he is 
about to, or he has slain Saul, the previously anointed king, it was certainly not in God's plan to do that. Sure, look, Saul was not a king to be desired. He would, did not, he certainly did not have the qualities of a king that the nation of Israel was seeking after. And Israel was already tired of him being king, right? But yet David would do no such thing to run ahead of God. God had given David no such instruction. And you, you see, friends, there's a big difference. Sometimes we consider providence the way that God guides us, right? But we got to make sure that we walk with God as well, that we understand His heart and His mind. We understand His guiding and His direction, that even though it seems like God brought Saul into their midst, it was never God's desire for Saul to be killed by David. And we got to be careful with providence, friends. Sometimes we call that just chance and luck, isn't it? And many times as Christians, we call it providence when sometimes God wants to test us. He wants to see whether really our heart is in the right place with him or not. And so, yes, he dangles something of a temptation or he allows the devil really to tempt us with that. But he wants to see how we'll react. He wants to see whether in our character and our hearts, we're going to do the right thing or not. What a big temptation it would have been for David. What a big temptation. And so even though he cuts off the skirt and Saul goes out of the cave, look what happens next. 1 Samuel 24, 8 to 12. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My Lord the King. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee, but mine eyes spared thee. And I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see, yea, the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand. And I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my, my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. David, he's standing there and he's showing, look, I have your garment in my hand. You were within arm's reach. I could have killed you, but I did not. The Lord avenge me of what you are doing to me, but I am not going to raise up my hand against you because I recognize you to be the Lord's anointed. You know, David was not trying to show how good or merciful a person he was. What was the purpose of him telling King Saul all these things? I could have killed you. You were right there. My soldiers asked me to kill you, but I did not. What was the purpose of telling him, look, I had this opportunity, but I didn't. David wasn't simply just trying to magnify his goodness and show how good a person he was, but he was trying to appeal to the good side of Saul. He was trying to show him that he had no desire to hurt him, even though he had every opportunity not just to hurt him, but to kill him. Even though Saul had the intention and he was hunting him, David could have called that a self-defense, right? You were trying to kill me and I was just defending myself. You're the one that came looking for me and you're the one that came into that cave trying to hunt me, but I just defended myself. No, he didn't. And he wasn't trying to just show that he was so good, but he was trying to help Saul to see, I have no evil desire. I have no evil intention. And even though all these things were within my possibility to do, to revenge, I didn't do it. He was trying to help Saul to see that he had no desire to take the throne away from him. He had no evil intentions. He had no desire to hurt him. He was trying to help Saul's heart to change. And so that's why he was saying all these things that his mercy that he had on him, maybe, just maybe, might go some ways in changing the heart of Saul. 
How does Saul respond when he hears this, though? Let's keep reading. Verses 16 to 22 of 1 Samuel 24. And it came to pass when David made an end of speaking these words unto Saul, that Saul said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Wow, he was emotional. Then he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas I have rewarded thee evil. Thou hast showed this day how thou hast dealt well with me, for as much as when the Lord had delivered me into thine hand, thou killest me not. For if a man find his enemy, will he let him go well away? Wherefore the Lord reward thee good for that thou hast done unto me this day. And now behold, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. Swear now therefore unto me by the Lord that thou wilt not cut off my seed after me, and that thou wilt not destroy my name out of my father's house. And David swore unto Saul, and Saul went home. But David and his men got them up unto the hold. Wow, Saul made a touching speech. He really was touched to the heart. The act of mercy really did speak so strongly to Saul. He realized, wow, I only had evil intentions and all you gave back to me was thoughts that were good. You had every opportunity to exact revenge on an enemy. And not because you hated me, but because I hated you. That's what Saul was saying. And then he realized, you're going to be the next king. But please remember my family. He made this touching speech. But at the end of it, guess what? Saul would go back to his palace. David would remain in the wilderness there. He would not go back to the palace with Saul. He did not trust him. And he had every right uh, belief not to trust him because so many times Saul had just had this false conversion. He had a short change in his heart and then he would go back to throwing javelins at David and trying to kill him. And so yes, for the most part, David would not believe that this was a true conversion, but it was just a temporary change. And now as we, we continue in the story though, you know, Saul's gone back, David remains in the wilderness. Now we have this kind of a break in the story. It's still about David, but so nothing to do with Saul this time. And this lesson and this, this break in the story is really important for us to understand the whole of what we're looking at even here in this lesson today. So Lee, look, look at this. Pay attention. Let's continue reading. What is this part of the story now about? 1 Samuel 25 verse 1. And Samuel died and all the Israelites were gathered together and lamented him and buried him in the house at Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. So Samuel dies and the whole nation mourns the loss. They realize their mistake in making themselves a king. And now their last connection between them and God now seems to have been severed because, you know, they knew that Saul was not a good man, but Samuel was still alive. And so it seemed to all the evil that Saul was, was about was being held in check by the presence of Samuel. But now Samuel is gone. And David, he flees even further off to Paran, the very edge of Israel towards Egypt. But let's keep reading. 1 Samuel 25, 2-9. There was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great. And he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. No doubt this man was a multimillionaire. Now the name of the man was Nabal and his wife, the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal did shear his sheep. And David sent out 10 young men. And David said unto the young men, get you up to Carmel and go to Nabal and greet him in my name. And thus shall you say to him that liveth in prosperity, Peace be both to thee, and peace to be thine house, and peace to be unto all that thou hast. And now I have heard that thou hast shearers. Now thy shepherds were with us, which were with us. We hurt them not, neither was there aught missing unto them all while they were in Carmel. Ask thy young men, and they will show thee. Wherefore let the young men find good favor in thine eyes, for we come in a good day. Give, I pray thee, whatsoever cometh to thine hand unto thy servants and to thy son David. 
And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David and ceased. So we've read quite a bit here, and the story is about Nabal and his wife Abigail and also David. So Nabal was a rich man, and David's men, wherever they were, of course, they, they were in different places in the wilderness, and wherever they were found, Nabal's sheep were sometimes crossing paths with them and the, the men that worked with him for him, of course, and they weren't missing anything. They did not miss a single sheep because why? David's men were guarding those sheep. They were taking care of them. And, you know, now it comes to this point where David probably is in a little bit of need. He's asking for some help for food and for those that were with him, right? He was appealing to the goodness of Nabal. He's like, look, I've helped you, please. If you would just be willing, give me some food. All this time that David was around, his troops had not taken anything and nothing had gone missing because David's men had been good and honest men. But we further read this, verse 15 and 16. But the men were very good unto us and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them. When we were in the fields, they were a wall unto us both by night and day. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. You see that? So the, the presence of David and his men had been like a wall of protection that had overflowed into a blessing to Nabal and all that he had for all his livestock, his cattle, his sheep. And so all David was asking for was a little provision. It wasn't too much. Of course, it was quite a bit. He was feeding all the people that were with him. But how does Nabal respond when he hears this request for help? How does Nabal respond? Verse 10 and 11 of 1 Samuel 25. And Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shearers and give it unto men whom I know nonce, not whence they be? In short, Nabal was not willing to help David. He was not willing to accommodate his request. And it's not because he didn't know David. You've you got to remember, David used to be the general in Saul's army. He was famous, right? Saul had slain his thousands. David, his ten thousands. He was a warrior, a mighty one, in fact. But the wickedness and selfishness of Nabal just said, I don't know who David is. I don't want to acknowledge him. He didn't want to regard David nor the help even that had been given to him. And so word comes back to David. And how does David respond? Let's keep reading. Verse 13 of 1 Samuel 25. And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. So we read here that they put on their swords. They're not just going to pay Nabal a visit. No, David is angry and he's ready to kill Nabal and destroy everything that he has simply because why? Nabal was rude to him and was not willing to regard him. What a difference we see in this picture of who David was before Saul and now who David is before this man Nabal. Someone had offended him and he is quick and ready to take revenge. All this time, he's been running for his life from King Saul, and Saul is trying to kill him for no reason, and yet he does not even dare to harm him even a little bit. But now we come to Nabal, who he's just asking for food. Nabal has not tried to hunt him or kill him, but now David has gotten really angry just because he's not willing to help him, right? And you know, we see here even good and righteous people, they have their moments where they slip up, they, they get a bit angry, they lose their temper, and yes, David did. He got offended. And so David is hot, he's angry, he's off for revenge, and he is, he's on the way. Something happens. Let's keep reading. Verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. So someone would have gotten word about what's happening and how David is on the way 
and you know he, they're relating the whole thing to to the the wife of Nabal, Abigail. And upon hearing this, what does she do? Verse eighteen and nineteen. Then Abigail made haste, and took two hundred loaves and two bottles of wine. Uh, yep, and and five sheep ready dressed five measures of parched corn and a hundred cluster uh, clusters of raisins, two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on asses. And she said unto her servants, Go before me, behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband, Nabal. This is how rich Nabal must have been. I mean, look, who has this sort of provision just sitting around? So by our calculation, he has 400 men, 200 soldiers left back at the, 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 the place where he is living, right? And many more other people that aren't soldiers, right? So there must have been a thousand people with David at the least, right? And yet, all of a sudden, Abigail is just able to pull this food and give it to him. 200 loaves we read there, right? And so much food and abundance. And Nabal was a rich man. He was. He had all this, and yet he was not willing to help David. And so she brings out this food to try to make peace with David. And on the way, as David is on the way to kill Nabal and destroy his whole household, as he sees all these things, how does Nabal respond? I mean, pardon me, how does David respond? Verses 32 to 33. And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me, and blessed be thy advice. Blessed be thou which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. You know, David, in his own admission, he was coming to avenge himself. His self was hurt. His pride was hurt. He was angry. He was hot. He was ready to take revenge. And he quickly comes to his senses because of all the provision that Abigail is giving him. And he realizes, oh, thank you for saving me from doing something that I would have regretted. He quickly relents, he quickly changes, he makes a U-turn, and he goes back with all the provisions that Abigail gives him. Many days later, Nabal, unaware of this, he finally comes to hear about it. What actually happens to him? Let's read in verse 37 to 38. After hearing the news from the night before, it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal. Pardon me, he hears the news in the morning. His wife tells him all these things that his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And it came to pass after 10 days that the Lord smote Nabal and that he died. What would happen? God would take this whole matter into his own hands. He would smite Nabal and he would die. That was it. Here, look, was a really important lesson for David to learn. And if not for Abigail, he would have walked ahead of God and he would have missed this really important lesson that would have probably led him down a path of even treating Saul wrongly in the future. But you see, David had to react. Learn to react, not to react, pardon me. Let me say that again. David had to learn not to react when he was offended. This was a really important lesson for the soon-to-be king. But secondly, he had to learn to trust God, that God would take the matter into his own hands at the appointed time, that David did not need to react simply because he was upset, hurt, or angry. It seemed like David already knew this, because of how he'd been treating King Saul, right? But yet somehow when it came to Nabal, he missed the mark. He missed the mark. And, and praise God for second chances that even in the midst of this trial that he's going through with King Saul, God allows this lesson of Nabal and, and this teaching point to come back to David and say, God is telling David, don't react. Do not react. What you did with King Saul at the very beginning, that was correct. And now you come to this, you're about to react. Thank God for Abigail, who was willing and able to stop him in his tracks. And you know, friends, this is really important because we must learn not to react in the face of our pride being hurt, of us being offended, of what something, someone said to us or what someone did to us. We've got to be so careful that we just don't react 
because we're angry. And David had every right really to be angry with Saul. He was hunting his life, but he didn't. And yet in this moment of passion with Nabal, he was ready to kill him and his whole household. And so let's continue. We come back to a different change in story. We finished with chapter 25. Now we go over to 1 Samuel 26 and verses 1 to 2. And the Ziphites came to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself in the hill of Hekelah? which is before Jeshimon. Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. So these Ziphites, you know, they, they come and they're helping Saul again and telling where David is and Saul comes chasing after again, ready to kill him, ready to destroy him. And then what do we see? Verses 5 to 12. And David arose and came to the place where Saul had pitched. And David beheld the place where Saul lay, Abner the son of Ner, the captain of his host. And Saul lay in the trench, and the people pitched round about him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai the son of Zariah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul, to the camp? And Abishai said, I will go down with thee. So so David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the trench, and his spear stuck in the ground at his bolster. But Abner and the people lay round about him. Then said Abishai to David, God hath delivered thine enemy into thine hand this day. Now therefore let me smite him, I pray thee, even with the spear, even to the earth at once, and I will not smite him the second time. And David said to Abishai, Destroy him not, for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said furthermore, As the Lord liveth, the Lord shall smite him, or his day shall come to die, or he shal descend into battle and perish. See, that that, that sounds like the the lesson that he learned from, from, uh, who, who is it, from Nabal, right? That the Lord will smite him. That's exactly what happened with Nabal. David is remembering these lessons that God is trying to teach him through these different experiences, right? But let's continue. Verse 11, the Lord forbid that I should stretch forth my hand against the Lord's anointed. But I pray thee, take thou now the spear that is at his bolster and the cruse of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the cruse of water from Saul's bolster and they gat them away and no man saw it nor knew it neither awaked for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord was fallen upon them. You see that? God put this extra deep sleep upon all of them so to allow David and his soldier to go down there and take from his very side his spear and his drinking bottle. Wouldn't we think that, hey, once again, God's providence, right? God's guiding us. I mean, surely God is the one that put the sleep on them. Surely God is doing this because he wants you to end Saul's life. But if it was not for the lesson from Nabal, surely David would have done that. After coming fresh from killing Nabal and all his house, and now Saul is coming to hunt me, surely it would not have been a stretch to think, okay, God, I know what you want me to do now. You see that? But God had taught him this lesson with Nabal to remind him again, do not stretch your hand against the Lord's anointed. I will deal with the situation. I dealt with Nabal. I will deal with Saul. How tempting it must have been. How tempting. But thank God that David did not raise his hand against the Lord's anointed. That would have created civil war. There would have been no union in Israel. He would have probably not been the next king. But yet, you see, friends, God allows us to go through these different experiences. Yes, he allows us to go through these different trials to to build us up, to change our character, to, to mold us, to make us ready to be fit to serve and to save us from different trials and perplexities and temptations that would come our way. And so, once again, he says, 
I'm not going to raise up my hand against the Lord's anointed. Yes, Saul was the Lord's anointed, and so was David. But one was a man that was chosen by other men, and this one, David, was chosen by God himself. And so finally, David and Abishai, they come out of the camp of Saul, and they're on this mountaintop, and they shout out to Saul to show him that they mean no harm. And they tell him, look, I have the spear, I have this cruise of water, your drinking bottle, I could have killed you, but I didn't. Once again, yes, it seems like David's bragging of his, bo- of his goodness and boasting about how good he is, but no, he's trying to appeal to the good side of Saul. Why are you coming to hunt after me? Who am I? Why do you have to keep looking for me? I've been faithful to you. I have no desire to kill you. You do not need to be afraid of me. Why are you coming after me? He's trying to help Saul to change. He's trying to open the eyes of Saul. And how does Saul respond? Verse 17, 21, and 25. And Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this thy voice, my son David? And David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do thee harm, because my soul was precious in thine eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. Then Saul said to David, Blessed be thou, my son David, thou shalt do both great things, and also shalt sit, shalt still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. It seemed like Saul had a change in his heart. He realized his sin. He was repenting openly, but yet David would still not trust him. He had not changed before. There was no hope that he would change now as well. Even though he admits all the wrong that he's done, even though he knows and he says it openly that David will be the next king and asks him to have mercy on his seed and his children and all that come after him, but David, he will not go back to the palace. He does not trust Saul. And there was nothing wrong with that. I don't think anyone in their right mind would as well. And so they part ways and one goes back to the palace, the other one off back to their wilderness, hiding in the wilderness. So look, twice, We see here that David had the opportunity to kill Saul, to hurt him, but he hasn't. Even though Saul had all these wicked and intentions against him to try to kill him, David had no such thing. Yet Saul would not change. The mercy of God and the mercy of David would never really touch a real chord in his heart. No matter how much compassion he showed him, Saul would not change. He would not stop hunting David. David's goodness never changed his circumstances. And you know, sometimes we we take a step back and we wonder, why would David do this? I mean, what's the point? Saul never changed, right? Why, Why do all these good things to him? But you see, friends, look, none of us are good. God, none of us are God. We don't see into the future. We don't know who will change because of the mercy that we show them. You see, God, he just wants us to have his character, to treat people with compassion, to treat people with tenderness and kindness and goodness and mercy. It, is, it was not for David to try to change his own circumstances. You know, it was not, he was, yeah, he, he was trying to do this and show him, look, I have no intention, please change your heart. But even though Saul seemed like he changed, every time he changed, later on, he would come back to try to hunt David, right? But at the very least, what God required of David was what? a Christ-like character under tribulation and persecution. And so, friends, this is important for us today because we ought to treat our enemies all with tenderness and compassion and mercy. And sometimes they'll change, sometimes they won't. And in this case, we see with Saul, he did not change. And so, we shouldn't do it for that desire, for that intention, for that motive and then get angry at God when we've shown this mercy and these people still continue to do this. This is exactly what happened with David. But we should do this. Why? Because that's exactly what Christ would do. Let's not just show this mercy because of 
other people are watching or, you know, we do it for other things or we just want it to change or we want to just throw it back in your face, you see? No, we do it with all the love and tenderness and humility and kindness and goodness of Christ. And if they change, good. If not, we will continue to be like that. That's the Christ-like character. And so friends, may God help us to continue to be like Christ in every which way, to have his love, to have his compassion, to have his mercy, that Christ would live in and through us and in every situation. And yes, some might change, but others, they might never change no matter how much we show compassion on them. But that's not for us to figure out. We don't know. We don't know who will change and who will. David didn't know, but he still did his best to give Saul every reason to stop hunting him, to show him that he had no ulterior motives, but all that he had for him was love and kindness and goodness. David was not secretly in the back trying to usurp the throne of David. No, he wasn't. He was just being faithful in all that God had put him in. And even Saul had put him in as well. And that was all. But the situation became like this. It was out of his control, but yet he would not change. He would not waver in his love and devotion and loyalty to the throne and where Saul sat. And even though Saul would never change, David would not allow the situation to change his character, to make him bitter, to make him angry, to make him do something that he might forever regret. And so friends, maybe you're going through an unpleasant circumstance in your life today. Maybe you're facing something that is not so nice to what people have done to you, and maybe they've done it on purpose. But what should we do? Instead of throwing the dirt back in their face, let us give them the cold cup of water if they need a drink. Let us give them the warm clothing if they're cold. Let us give them the food to eat if they're hungry. Let us show them that we mean no harm, that even though you might hate me, even though you might intentionally do bad things to me, let me show you, I have nothing against you. I might not trust you, and David didn't trust Saul, but I had nothing to say bad against you and to desire wickedness and evilness in your life. Let us learn to love as Christ loved as well. Learning to love our enemies, yes. Come, let's pray. Oh, Father, Lord, we need your love. We need your goodness. We need your character in our hearts and lives. So often, we, we are found treating people like how the world treats people. We, we, they, they're angry at us, and we get angry at them as well. But Lord, this is not your spirit. This is not your character. Lord, teach us to love our enemies. It is so difficult. It is so hard. And sometimes it is so hurtful. And we understand that David must have been hurt many times in seeing how Saul just decided to kill him and hunt his life. Lord, please, may nothing of any experience that we go through that is of a bad nature, that is bitter circumstance, may that never change our characters into a bitter experience as well. But Lord, help us. Help us to be like Jesus. Help us that we might always show your character to all those around us. Guide us, Lord. We cannot do this on our own. Help us to be like Christ today. Give us your spirit, Lord. Fill our hearts is our earnest plea and prayer. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, friends. God bless you all. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for joining us today. May God continue to be with you through every circumstance and situation. And may we not allow any situation to change us to be worse, but rather let us cling and hold tighter to Christ through every circumstance that we're facing today. Until next time, may God be with you. God bless.